Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 30 of the Clarinet Podcast, the show where I discuss all that's neat and new with clarinet, with the neatest people in the industry. In today's episode, I discuss how to get started with reed making with Laura Grant, who is a clarinetist in the Washington, D.C. metro area. She is the clarinet instructor at several nationally recognized middle and high school wind programs, including James Middleton High School in Vienna, Virginia, which is a two-time Sudler Flag of Honor recipient, and Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, which has consistently been ranked best public high school in the country by Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report. Laura maintains a large private clarinet studio, attracting beginners, advanced clarinetists, and even adults. She performs exclusively on her own handmade reeds and is enthusiastic about sharing her reed knowledge with other clarinetists. She attracts clarinetists from the eastern region of the United States for reed adjustment and reed making lessons and leads reed clinics in her studio, online, and at schools. Her reed making video has been viewed over 90,000 times on YouTube. Laura feels strongly that an increased knowledge of reeds has benefited her own clarinet playing and that appropriately progressive experience will help clarinetists of every level take control of their performance consistency. The giveaway for this episode is a Diderio reed case that features replaceable humidity control packs for optimum performance. If you'd like to make sure you're eligible to win items mentioned on the podcast, please visit clarinet.com and be sure to sign up for our email mailing list. This episode was brought to you by Diderio Woodwinds. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, Diderio is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques. So you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from Diderio Woodwinds, visit diderio.com woodwinds. Hi, Laura, and welcome to the Clarinet.com podcast. Thanks so much for coming on the show today to share your knowledge about reed making. Thanks for having me, Sean. I'm really excited to talk about reeds with all your listeners. So before we get started, um, you're an active teacher in the Washington, D.C. area, but what more could you tell me about what you do day to day? Um, so I teach a private studio of students uh, ranging from beginners through adults, um, adult beginners and adults who are looking to get back into playing the clarinet after some time away. And I also teach sectionals for clarinet students out here in some of the public schools. Is that like uh, workshops in the schools? Like something, I guess we'd call those clinics in Canada. It's kind of like a group lesson. Right. Um, I do clinics and then I also do weekly classes. So some of the schools out here have um, instructors that specialize in individual instruments come in once a week and meet with the students in groups. Oh, wow. So you have a school that you actually are the dedicated clarinet teacher at. Exactly. Yeah. I'm a county employee and I work with, uh, with individual schools weekly. Wow, I can't tell you how much I wish we had that here. Not only it's, for my, it's amazing. <laughs> well, not only for my own benefit, but for the students. I mean, it's incredible the bad habits that that happen after only having a two-hour session once a year with the clinician. You know. Yes. Uh huh. It's something I didn't even know existed until I moved out here, and it's it's just an amazing support system for the students in the schools. So, what got you into making your own reeds in the first place? It's a it's a step that a lot of clarinet players don't even imagine that they should take, let alone give it a try. Right, right. Um, well, as I as I was going through high school and going through college, I was doing what most of us do as clarinetists, where, you know, we open the box of reeds and we're lucky if we find, you know, four of them that are working consistently and are sounding like we want them to. Um, and so I was doing adjustments on them with knives and sandpaper and reed rush and just trying to make the best of the situation. And about five years ago, uh, my husband, Chris, and I went and took a lesson specifically on how to make reads from uh, Dr. Charles West at Virginia Commonwealth University. And so that was my first time making a read. Uh, and I think I made it from a blank as opposed to making it entirely from scratch from tube cane. And it was really eye opening to me because that first read, you know, was was pretty rough that I made, um, but it was still hands down the best read I'd ever played on. And it was, it was pretty eye opening to realize that, um, by taking control of the read making process from a little bit earlier on, um, I could, I could yield such fantastic results. 
So it's only been five years and you already feel like, well, even the first read was better. What are they like now then? Are they just glorious or? <laughs> oh, they're, they're, um, they're, I mean, a, a good read that I make myself is, in my opinion, better than any of the ones that I was getting out of the box. And at this stage in the game, I'm able to make them, put them on my clarinet and play them without nearly the kind of time commitment that I was making by breaking in a store-bought read and then doing adjustments to it with knives or sandpaper. So you don't think there's any sort of like placebo effect because you spend so much time making it, right? It's. Do you think it's the adjustability perhaps? Like you can clip it to exactly where you want or... Um, I think it has more to do with the precision right from kind of early on in the process. So when when a manufacturer makes a read, um, even under the best circumstances, it's unlikely for it to be perfectly balanced. And when you're doing it yourself, um, you know, you're, you're not going through the quantity. You're able to make sure everything's lined up, make sure it's good cane right from the beginning. Um, so there are fewer variables. So when you said you were sort of surprised by how it turned out or impressed, maybe this is just me, but I would have faced some sort of self-doubt, like, who am I to make reads? <laughs> is that part of why you felt that, or is it more? No, it was it was just kind of an embarrassing disaster during the entire process. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure you questioned that, though, like how we're sort of taught that for clarinet players, especially you just, you, you buy the read and, and you might adjust it, but it's kind of a sacred thing. You don't really touch it too much and you definitely don't make your own. Um, right. Right. So I'm just interested how you cross that bridge, I guess, mentally. <laughs> well, it started as, as just a learning experience. The more I knew about it, the better I thought I would be able to adjust a read that I get out of the package. Um, and it was just, it was just kind of a rabbit hole. The more, the more I learned about it, the more I wanted to do it. And the next piece of equipment you know, jumped on the read desk as I as I got farther into it. So let's talk about the equipment. Are the startup costs prohibitive to do this? Honestly, the startup costs are are pretty significant. I think that I was in a good position to be able to start doing this because both my husband and I are professional clarinetists, so we both had equal equal interest in it. Um, and because I was already teaching actively and he was already performing actively, um, we were able to support the endeavor. Um, after a few years, um, and I've done the math, um, so after a few years of using blanks, um, the cost would kind of even itself out for a clarinetist, um, but the startup cost is is relatively significant. And does the cost even out because you're saving money per read and you're getting more out of each read? Or Each read lasts longer, you're more likely to get a good read, and a pound of cane is only $45. Wow. So I guess that that's one other thought that I had. Is this sort of a frugal choice if you want to go that way and you also get better results? You have to spend money to save money. <laughs> and you say a little bit prohibitive, but I think that would mean a little something different for a college student versus a prof professor or something. Is it a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks or what are we talking? No, we're talking about a thousand. A thousand. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, and you, you can get into it, um, you know, get into it slowly. You'd, you'd start a course with the knives and the sandpaper and the plexiglass to make your adjustments. And then if you really want to dive into it, you can get some of the measuring tools. And then if you want to start making your own reads from blanks, you can get a profiler. And so then you're talking about several hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to start going from cane, you have to spend a little bit more to start splitting it. I mean, you don't have to spend any of the money. I've made reads from Kane with knives and files, but that's just a huge time commitment. Um, so I don't think that that's realistic for most of us. So let's just explain some of the terminology here. So Kane, of course, that's the actual pieces of, it's not wood, it's like a, um, it's like a <laughs> literally it's kind of a reed grass plant that's really thick, right? It's big and round. How big around is it? That's an interesting question, actually. It varies depending on the instrument that you're making reeds for. Um, clarinet cane, I've never measured it. It's probably about four inches. So kind of like a pop can? No, a lot less than that. Think in the, more in like the, golf In the ball. video, it looked very big, actually. Yeah, it, uh, maybe a golf ball. Okay, so like a golf ball around. And so you <laughs> buy them in, in kind of sticks then that are about how long? Um, the sticks range from maybe 8 to 12 inches. 
And then you cut that into how many reeds can you make from one round piece of cane stick, if we can call it that. <laughs> right. Um, so What's, is there you, a term or is that close enough? It, a tube cane, yeah. Tube cane, um, okay. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a giant cane, um, Arundo Donex. You can actually get it at the garden center down the street from us. It's, it's illegal in some states because it's so invasive, but we can get it here in Virginia. Um, like so to, you, to grow, you mean? Yeah. Oh, wow. If you, if you want it in your yard. Yeah. Um, but you you take this this harvested dried segmented cane and you quarter it, and from each quarter, um, theoretically you could get between two and three reeds. Wow! So you know we're we're talking eight to twelve reeds. Not all of those are actually going to be usable segments because the grain has to be straight and the bark has to be flat in order for it to turn out well. Um, so you know from from a pound of cane, you're not going to get hundreds of reeds, um, but for the cost of two boxes of reeds, you're you're doing a lot better than 20 reeds. That's crazy. So I, I was just thinking how how much my ignorance is showing, and in a way, how sad that is. But you know, I have a music degree. I've been playing for 15 years. It's like mm-hmm. how do I, how do I not know more about this? But it's just something that's never really explored. So. We're going to put on the website for the show notes page a complete list of kind of what you need to get started and how much that stuff is. Maybe I'll even link to it on Amazon or something so you can so you can have a look and sort of see what it's like. Um, but would you sort of just walk us through the t- sort of top 10 items you need to get started? Sure. Um, why don't we talk about it as if we're starting with blanks as opposed to starting with cane, because that's where most of us would kind of start the journey. Yeah, we, we should explain the difference, actually. Yeah. Um, so a blank is basically imagine a clarinet reed that you get out of a box, except that the tip of it has not been cut into an arch and the vamp is not nearly thin enough to actually play. So it's the same shape as a reed and there's a rough first cut that takes off some of the cane and some of the bark along where the vamp will be. Um, But then you would put that in your profiler and the profiler is the thing that shapes the vamp of the reed um, to make it playable. And some clarinetists actually, instead of using blanks, they use store-bought reeds. They get you know, they get a Van Dorn read a strength harder than they're actually going for, and then they put it in the profiler and finish it themselves. So blanks are about 85 cents per. Um, when I'm showing clarinetists for the first time how to make reads, that's what we start with um, because it simplifies the process a lot in terms of time and cost. But of course, there are disadvantages to using blanks too, which is why I started using cane. So just for those who are totally beginning here, the mm-hmm. va- the vamp is kind of the slope on the reed, correct? Yes, yeah. The vamp is the slope part that your lip is your lower lip is placed on. So you have the back of the reed, the table of the reed. Um, that's the flat part that goes on the mouthpiece. The butt or the heel of the reed is kind of the bottom end of it. Um, the tip of the reed, obviously, uh, is the tip, and the that vamp is the kind of the angled part, I guess you'd say. So where do you take it from there? You've got your your the initial sort of vamp mm-hmm. cut on there, and how do you t- take it from that point? Okay, so you have your blank, um, which would not play if you put it on the clarinet because it's much too thick, um, and you would put it on your profiler. That's kind of the kind of the big guy on the reed desk. Um, most clarinetists uh, are familiar with the term reed dual. Reed dual is a reed dual is where I started. Um, and that one basically works like a key cutter. That's the one that's uh, in the YouTube video that you mentioned as we were kind of doing our pre-interview here. Um, the read to all uses a rotating piece of sandpaper to make the blank match uh, a read that you put in the other side of the machine. So you have a read that you decide that you like. You put it on as the master read and the read to all sands the blank so that it matches the shape of the master read. It's kind of like reverse 3D printing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it works like a key cutter. Um, so theoretically, you end up with a read just like the one you started with. That's very cool. And that's the most expensive piece, you said, right, of the whole thing? That's the most expensive piece, yes. Um, now, about a year ago... Chris, my husband, and I decided to change from the read to all to the Ool profiler. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are others like the Ool. The, the Ool uses a knife instead of sandpaper. So it's 
you know, when you're using the sandpaper, it's loud and it's dusty for one thing. And for another thing, each rotation of the wheel changes the grit on the sandpaper a little bit. So it's not perfectly consistent. It's a lot more consistent, but not perfectly. In the wool or other machines that use a knife, um, you can adjust the the blade by a hundredth of a millimeter. You know, it, it the there's a little a little tool that clicks on it um, to to make a, a precise measurement. And you can do three to 500 reads before you have to change the knife. So it was kind of an upgrade for us, I think. Wow, that's a lot of reads. So yes. I've, I've never thought about exactly how many reads someone uses a year, but that sounds like the, that could get the two of you through quite a while. Yeah, yeah, we can we can go a pretty long time, um, even even both playing quite a bit before we need to switch out. So you've used the read, I'm going to call it the read cloner. Yes. <laughs> you've used that device. Um, uh -huh. Then, of course, you must have to hand finish it. And what about the tip? Correct. Yeah. So you have the profiler, the the read cloner, as you said. Um, and the after you finish on the profiler, the vamp is shaped. So that arched part um, isn't there yet, but the angled slope, I guess, of the read is is there. So then you'd want to use a micrometer. And a micrometer is a handy thing to have even if you're not making your own reads because it's what measures the thickness of the read. And it, it measures, again, to the one hundredth of a millimeter. So if you're using store-bought reads and just learning about consistency or you're making adjustments to your reads, you need to have the micrometer so you can keep track of what you're doing. Um, so once you're happy with the measurements of the tip of your read, and I usually go for um, one tenth of a millimeter across the whole tip. Then you'd use the reed clipper to make the arch at the top of the reed so that it matches up with the top of your mouthpiece. So those reed clippers, I've always wondered, do you have to buy them specific for, of course, the instrument? Um, mm -hmm. But the point at which you clip the reed, like how you're deciding that based on the thinness that you made it, is that correct? The... The read profiler, when you put your blank in, you put the tip of the blank where you want the tip of the arch to be when you're done with the process. Oh, I see. So that the the slope matches your master read. So it's definitely something you decide before exactly where you want it and how long it should be and stuff. That's right. Yes. And a read clipper, um, I think, is one of the first read working tools that a student should get. Because you can use a reed clipper to um, make a store-bought reed a little bit harder. You can use it to just slightly extend the life of a reed that's kind of on its last legs. It's a very handy tool to have. Let's talk about that for a minute. Because I think a lot of people could get a lot of use out of a reed clipper. And they're Absolutely. only 30 or $50. Exactly. Which sounds like a lot. But if you save 10 reeds at $3 a piece with a reed clipper, it's sort of paid yep. for itself, you know? Yep. And so it's really handy for a teacher, too, because if a student comes in with a read with a little chip at the end, you can snip off the top of it. and Well, and usually they, they soften up a little as they break in. So when you yep. chop off that tiny little bit. So let's go over to yep. how to use that a little bit. Okay. So the read clipper that I use is the Cordier uh, read clipper, and I've removed the clamp on the bottom. Like that's the little, this little piece that snaps over, right? Right. Yeah. I So you just un, unscrew that part um, when you... When I used to use it and it had the clamp on it, I never used the clamp because as soon as you clamp it shut, the reed shifts and you have to start over. That's been my um, trouble with this thing, yeah, actually, so it's, always. It's just in the way. So I, I just took the, the silly clamp part off um, and you hold it with your fingers anyway. Um, and then it, it basically works like a, like a dog toenail clipper and it snips off the tip of the reed um, to make it just slightly shorter. And you don't want to use more than, or you don't want to remove more than about a hair's width of reed at any one time. Cause you can't put it back on. But yeah. It's a nifty little tool and, and it has saved a few reads for me that I don't use it all the time. I mean, I'm, I should be adjusting my reads more, but I'm just so guilty of not doing it. I, I, I think a lot of people are in that boat. Yeah. Unfortunately, yep. I think so. But it's it's funny how much effort we put into choosing the right clarinet and the right mouthpieces and the right ligature, but we kind of accept mediocre reads as this inevitability, and it's so it's so unnecessary to just resign yourself 
Well, you know, or, to, or, or people spend a lot of time picking the reed, but in the time they spent picking it, maybe they could have fixed the one they just grabbed from the box, you know? Yeah, that's fair too. Yeah. So yeah, it's something I'd, I'd really like to get more into. And obviously you have to practice it. Um, I think that's maybe what scares a lot of, you know, mm-hmm. pro- professionals and, and older students, especially is that they're used to doing something one way and they, they kind of don't want to, it's not that they don't want to learn maybe something new, but it's, it's, it's kind of scary at first because you don't know what you're doing at all. Um, there's such a small number of clarinet uh, professors and teachers that have a great grasp of this too. So you were lucky to find one close by. Yeah, I agree. I think I think it's a good idea for music schools to have a, a reed studio for their students to take advantage of. So maybe each clarinetist doesn't have the opportunity to use the equipment themselves, but just practicing a little, like you said, or taking some time to take a couple lessons on how to make reeds teaches you so much about the construction and maintenance of reeds that you're a lot better able to handle what you get out of the box on a daily basis. So you said you actually have your students try this sometimes. What What is their thought on this? Are they fascinated by it? Are they kind of intimidated? What do they think? It, it ranges. I think that's part of what appeals to me so much about reed making. I'm, I'm kind of a hands-on person. I'm, I'm a science person. I'm a crafting person. And it, so it, it takes, it takes these other interests that I have and allows me to put it toward what I do professionally. And so you have some students that probably would take no interest in it at all. And I'm just forcing them to do it. But um, then you have other students who are just amazed and, you know, I'll have a student come back from an audition and they'll say, I, I played on the read that I made in our lesson. And it was, it was phenomenal. It was, um, it was consistent. It was exactly what I expected. So, so some of the students really get into it um, and are excited about seeing the equipment. And, you know, when you make that final clip with the reed clipper and it turns it into a clarinet reed, it's a pretty empowering thing, even for a young student. Yeah, it's exciting. Nowadays, we're so distanced from sort of the products that we use in a lot of ways. And uh, to kind of get back in there and, and start from from the beginning and make something is really Really amazing, actually. So, oh. so yeah, I think it's fantastic you're doing this. Um, where can we find you online? Um, so my studio website is grantclarinetstudio.com. Um, I also have a Facebook page for Grant Clarinet Studio, and that's where I have information about the read equipment that I use and about my students and myself. Um, and there's also a Grant Clarinet Studio YouTube page, um, which has kind of a small amount of videos, but, um, several that are quite popular, including the one about reed making, um, which kind of shows the process that we talked about today. I should mention she's being very modest. That video has over 90,000 views, which is amazing. So a lot of people must be interested in, in reed making, even if they are, are not making them themselves yet. So yeah, it, if you see the process, um, you can see. I mean, these tools. If you get good tools, it's you wouldn't even have to be a clarinetist to do it until the final couple steps. Um, the the tools make it so that all of your reads end up exactly to your specifications, which is partly why you get such consistent and predictable results. Yeah, I think it's really amazing. It's something that I. Now I'm looking, now I'm starting to think, oh, maybe this is something else I want to get into. You got to be, <laughs> almost got to be careful though. But this is something that I think would be very worthwhile. I mean, you've kind of opened my eyes to the, not only the savings, but the the quality and the fact that you have so much control. Um, it would be it, very interesting. It's really, it's really a wonderful process. It's, it's wonderful to be so hands-on with one of the aspects of our playing that contributes so much to, um, the tone coming through the clarinet, your voice coming through the clarinet, the reed is so responsible for that aspect of it. Um, and you can really refine what you're getting out of your instrument. Do you buy any stock reeds anymore? I buy stock reeds for my students. And do, and they, um, at what age do you start having them learn to adjust? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the high schoolers can do it from blanks. I've had only a couple of students make them all the way from cane. And even in that process, I do some of the steps myself, um, just because it, it makes me a little concerned to see 
a student holding a giant chisel. Um, so <laughs> I can't imagine why. That's <laughs> hmm, <laughs> yes, there, there are some aspects that I take control of if for nothing other than liability issues. Um, but middle schoolers are able to do some of the process. Usually elementary school and early middle school, we're still talking about the proper break-in process and getting sandpaper. Um, and I really think that's a necessary first part of the read learning experience. Well, in a very young child won't necessarily even know what they really want out of the read yet. No, so. exactly. Yeah, they're still trying to remember which is B-flat and which yeah. is B-natural. Which hand goes where again? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, great. So I think we had a fantastic conversation here. Before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to get out there and talk about with your read making? No, I think I think we covered from blank to musical instrument pretty well. Um, the, the process of making cane to blank is kind of a whole nother ball game. Um, but really the whole, the whole process is so interesting to me. Um, and I really think that it's informative and empowering for clarinetists to know more about the read making process. Um, and kind of where, where that part of their clarinet comes from. Fantastic. Well, this has been a great conversation. I'm so glad that, uh, we got the chance to share sort of how to do this with the audience. It's something new for a lot of people, I think. Um, mm -hmm. For listeners, if you have any questions, um, go ahead and post them in the comments there. And uh, maybe I can pass them along to Laura and she can answer them on her YouTube channel potentially or, uh, sure. in, or in the comments. I imagine there's going to be some sort of uh, thoughts about this. Or if you've tried it, I'd actually be interested to hear your experience there as well. So. Absolutely. And I'd, I'd be interested to hear how people like their equipment that's different than mine too. If they look at the list of equipment I'm using, if they're really excited about a piece of read working equipment, I'd love to hear their feedback. Yeah, I guess it's like anything else. There's, there's probably competitors for the manufacturing equipment oh, too. Yeah. So mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Absolutely. this has been great. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast today, Laura. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques, so you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds. <laughs>